Hello, uh, I'm very pleased to be invited to the BINC uh, fifth uh, symposium. I've been to the previous ones and always been impressed by scientific quality, and I really look forward to participating in this symposium too. My name is Bo Lonedal. I'm a professor emeritus at Departments of Nutrition and Internal Medicine at the University of California, Davis. And today, the topic I would like to talk about is the roles of milk osteopontin in infant health. For those of you not familiar with osteopontin, this is a very interesting protein. It's a unique protein in, in that it's highly acidic, it's phosphorylated, it's a glycoprotein, and it is really extensively post-translationally modified. That means that there's a lot of phosphate groups and carbohydrate groups uh, along the molecule. Osteopontin contains an aspartate domain, an RGD domain as we call it, which binds to integrins. So it's important for integrin binding. It has a domain which is also recognized by the CD44 receptor. This means that osteopontin can bind to the cell surface and start signaling events, very important for biological activities. Osteopontin, as you may have guessed from its name, is synthesized by many other tissues uh, besides the mammary gland. It was first found in bone. That's why it's called osteopontin. But then it's been found in brain, immune organs, and the intestine. And it's present in many body fluids, such as milk, serum, and cerebrospinal fluid. It's a very interesting protein in that it has a lot of biological functions. It's actively involved in cell proliferation, cell survival, biomineralization, leukocyte recruitment, inflammation, immune modulatory functions, wound healing, and initiation of cell-mediated immune responses. So as you can see, many of these are involved in immune function. And here we have some interesting results from our lab. Uh, we analyzed osteopontin in breast milk throughout lactation period. And on the bottom you have days of lactation, uh, first up to day 14, and then at 1, 2, 4, 6, and 12 months. And as you can see, the concentration of osteopontin is quite high early on, but it maintains a steady high concentration throughout lactation. In fact, if you look at the whey proteins in breast milk, it's the sixth most common uh, whey protein. So it's really present in sizable concentrations. So it's high in breast milk, but unfortunately it's low in cow's milk and therefore in infant formula, which is based on cow's milk. Here you can see a compilation of results from different research groups, and you can see, similar to what you saw in the previous picture, it's high in colostrum. But in term human milk, the concentration is also high, while cow's milk only contains about 18 milligrams per liter, and because of processing of bovine milk, infant formula contains only about 9 milligrams per liter. So formula-fed infants get very little osteopontin in the diet. What is also known is that osteopontin can survive proteolysis under gastric conditions. That is, it's resistant to be degraded in the stomach. There are also data in the literature that milk osteopontin survives in mouse pups when they are nursing their moms. So this suggests that not only can it survive uh, the digestion process, but it can therefore also uh, act in the small intestine, which we will see later on. The nice part is that nowadays, bovine or cow's milk osteopontin is commercially available, and therefore it can possibly be added to infant formula. But for that, as scientists, we have a few prerequisites that we would like to fulfill before we do that. The homology, that is the identity between the bovine and human osteopontin should be high, 
which which it is. They are not identical, but in phosphorylation regions and glycosylation regions, they are very similar. Even more important, the binding sites on the osteopontin molecule that binds to cells to these receptors that I mentioned, they are identical in bovine and human osteopontin. So therefore, we believe that it would be highly likely that cow's milk osteopontin could have biological functions similar to those of osteopontin in breast milk. We started doing our research in an infant rhesus monkey model. Uh, here at UC Davis, we have a monkey or a primate colony where we have infant rhesus monkeys that can be used for preliminary clinical studies. It's a very nice facility, and we did this pilot study to see if we add osteopontin, bovine osteopontin, to infant formula. Would the rhesus infants accept that and do well on that formula? And we, we knew from the past that regular infant formula can be fed to infant rhesus monkeys, and they do just as well as breastfed uh, rhesus monkeys. So in this case, we added bovine osteopontin a limited number of uh, monkeys, but what we were able to do, which we cannot do in human infants, is that we could take biopsies from the small intestine, from the jejunum. And from these biopsies, we could look at gene expression, looking at messenger RNA that we have extracted. And we fed them for three months. The monkeys did quite well. No problems, no adverse effects. They grew very well. And then when we looked at the intestine and the genes, there were a lot of different genes that were affected between the breastfed and the formula fed groups. More than a thousand genes were differentially expressed between breastfed and formula fed groups. But when we added bovine osteopontin to the formula, you can see that then that difference of 1,017 genes was diminished to only 217. This means that the intestinal transcriptome, that is the genes expressed in the formula fed monkeys, they are different, but adding bovine osteopontin at the same level as you have in breast milk shifted the profile and made them more similar to that of the breastfed infants. So this was very promising. They did well on the formula with osteopontin and it seemed to make them more similar to breastfed infants. After that, we were ready to do a clinical study. And I will, in the next few slides, go over a very nice clinical study that was done at Fudan University uh, in Shanghai by Dr. Peng. Uh, she did a fantastic job recruiting subjects and carrying through this clinical trial with us in collaboration. And we looked at growth, nutrition, and immune function of breastfed infants and compared them to infants that were fed formula with added bovine osteopontin. We started at one month of age, and we went on to six months of age. And this study, as you can see, was funded by Arla Foods and Bios Time. And the reason for that, as you can see at the bottom, we needed a regular good quality formula, which is the Bios Time Premium, and then the raw material, the bovine osteopontin, was from Arla Foods in Denmark. We had four groups. Like I said, a reference uh, group of, consisting of breastfed infants, and then three formula fed groups. And this was a randomized controlled study, so it was double blind. Neither the investigator nor the nurses knew which infant got which formula until we analyzed the results after the study was done. The first group of formula fed infants, the RF group, got the regular infant formula. That means that it had no added osteopontin, and in this case, it contained 15 milligrams of osteopontin per liter. And then we had regular formula, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to which we had added bovine osteopontin 
to about half the level that we see in mature breast milk. And then we had another group, the F130, which had a level similar to that of human milk osteopontin. We did a lot of measurements in this study. We, of course, measured the anthropometry, weight, length, and head circumference. We did this when they were born, and then every month up to six months of age. We took blood samples by venipuncture at one, four, and six months of age. And then the parents, uh, under instructions of the nurses who visited the parents, uh, they filled out a feeding dietary journal, so we had good records of what they were eating. And then they had a morbidity journal where they put in when their infants were sick. And we also got tolerance data such as stool characteristics, etc. So they were, in principle, exclusively breastfed or exclusively formula fed up to four months of age. After that, they started getting some weaning food. So the real intervention is up to four months. We did a lot of analysis, like I mentioned. We did the blood parameters, the hematology, and we also did flow cytometry or fax analysis on fresh blood at Fudan University. Uh, unusual to do in clinical studies, and it gave us a lot of very interesting information, which is why I have highlighted it in red here. We looked at gene expression in the blood cells uh, together with Dr. Donovan at University of Illinois. We measured at the hospital serum, or here at Davis, uh, serum ferritin, plasma amino acids, blood urea and nitrogen, and all of these, there were no differences really between the formula fed groups and the breast fed infants. Then we analyzed cytokines at UC Davis to look at kind of uh, immunological parameters. Like I said, the, the study was very well carried out by Dr. Peng, and you can see that dropouts were very few. Uh, this is a sign of success when you can keep this many infants in the study for such a long time with regular blood samples drawn. Uh, very impressive research work by the clinician. Here you can see just one example which I mentioned was not, there was no difference. There's always a trend, as you can see, of the breastfed infants gaining a little bit more weight than the formula fed ones, but there was no significant difference between the groups. Nor were there any differences in height. They had the same height, uh, both at one, four, and six months of age. So this means that all infants in the study grew normally. And there were further no differences in adverse effects, very, very few adverse effects. And there were no differences in appetite, the formula volume consumed, or sleeping time, which all of these we recorded, but there were no differences among the formula fed groups. So therefore, the formula that we fed with osteopontin was safe and adequate. I cannot go over all the results from the immune profile, but I want to highlight this one, which is uh, very significant for the outcome of the study, in my opinion. The inflammatory cytokine, TNF-alpha, is always higher in formula-fed infants than in breast-fed infants. We don't know why, if this is a sign of a minor inflammation in the intestine or what it is but TNF-alpha is elevated in the serum of formula-fed infants. And here you can see first at one month of age that the regular formula ones infants had higher levels than those fed uh, either osteopontin formula or were breastfed. But at one month of age, there were no significant differences. The variation was high, and that is because some of these infants had been formula fed for a while. They had not been on the osteopontin formula. So that really, one month is the starting point, but the starting point is not identical for them. But at four months of age, we have very clear results. 
Here you can see significantly higher TNF alpha values in infants fed regular formula as compared to breastfed infants. Like I said, other researchers have reported this before. But what we were able to do was that we could reduce the levels of TNF alpha in the infants fed formula supplemented with bovine osteopontin. And particularly at the higher level, which is similar to that of breast milk, there was no longer any significant difference from the breastfed infants. So no significant difference. We were able to eliminate this difference. At six months of age, the picture is different. And it's most like there were no significant differences there. There's a high degree of variation. And that is because all these infants had started on weaning foods. And therefore, the, the picture becomes more complicated. But after four months, they only received formula or only received breast milk. We looked at other uh, cytokines too and got a similar picture. The inflammatory cytokines were higher in the formula fed infants. Osteopontin reduced those levels. We also looked at anti-inflammatory cytokines and saw similar things there. The osteopontin made the infants more similar to breastfed infants. Well, does this really matter? Well, we looked, like I said, at morbidity. And here you can see, again, formula-fed infants or infants-fed regular formula at significantly more days with fever than those that were breastfed. Again, similar to what most studies uh, internationally have shown before. But when we added osteopontin, this was not any longer significant. So if you add bovine osteopontin, you were able to reduce illness in formula-fed infants to a level which is not different from that of breastfed infants, something which I find highly biologically significant and important. We also looked at, like I said, the, the immune cells by doing flow cytometry. And I won't go into detail, we did measure a lot of different cells, but what we found was, in particular in the high osteopontin group, the one that got osteopontin in the formula at the level similar to breast milk, they had an increased T cell proportion. So these important immune cells were increased in the, the group that received the high level of bovine osteopontin. So together with the other things, we, we concluded that this suggests that osteopontin may favorably influence immune ontogeny in infancy and that the effects appear to be dose dependent. That is, it's likely that a level of osteopontin in the formula should be similar to that in breast milk. Overall, we concluded from the clinical trial that addition of osteopontin resulted in no significant differences in adverse effects, formula intake, growth, or sleep as compared to feeding regular formula. We got immune cell distribution and cytokine responses, which were more similar uh, between infants fed the higher level of osteopontin and breastfed infants. Days with fever was significantly higher in infants fed regular formula, but not in infants fed formula with osteopontin. So, feeding infants with formula with added osteopontin resulted in outcomes more similar to those of breastfed infants, which again, I think is a major achievement. We did some follow-up studies on this, which I find very uh, interesting also. As you can see in this slide, we measured the human osteopontin. That is what is made in the infant by itself uh, in the plasma of breastfed and formula fed infants. And at one month when they start, you can see that there is more human osteopontin in the breastfed infant than in those that uh, get regular formula. But 
those formulas that contain bovine osteopontin result in higher osteopontin levels uh, of the human osteopontin in plasma. This was significant at four months and significant at six months. So a pronounced uh, elevation of endogenous uh, synthesis of osteopontin. And I will come back to this a bit later when I talk about some of the animal experiments we have done. Uh, this agrees really well with those results. Then, of course, we also measured bovine osteopontin in the plasma of the breastfed and formula fed infants. And like you would suspect, the breastfed infants and those that were fed formula without any added osteopontin had very, very little or nothing uh, in their plasma. But those two groups that received formula with bovine osteopontin had significantly higher levels of uh, plasma bovine osteopontin and higher levels in those that received high, <coughs> higher level of osteopontin. After concluding the, the human trials, we wanted to go back to the drawing board. Uh, when we did the clinical trial, we really focused on immune function. But research was going on with osteopontin. And we started suspecting that osteopontin actually could have more biological activities than being involved in immune function. So therefore, we developed a knockout, knockout mouse model to study what really milk osteopontin can do. We know that osteopontin is present in many tissues, but what about what infants will get in their mouth that is milk osteopontin? We hypothesized or assumed that milk osteopontin would play important roles in brain, immunological, and gut development during early life. And the design of the study is as follows. You will see quite a lot of results from these studies. We have regular, or what we call white type, white type uh, dams, that is mothers. So mouse mothers that are feeding their pups milk with osteopontin. Mouse milk contains just about as much osteopontin as breast milk, proportionally. And then we had mothers that have a knockout in the gene for osteopontin. That means that this mother, she doesn't have any osteopontin in her tissues, but more importantly, she produces milk, which contains no osteopontin whatsoever. And then we let mouse pups, regular, normal, white type pups, feed mothers that have no osteopontin, or have regular levels of osteopontin. The nice part with mouse or mouse dams is that you can easily cross foster them. They don't really distinguish between what is her own pups or another dam's pups. So you can take a lot of normal white type pups and then just cross foster them into these mothers and they will treat them like their own babies. And here is um, the design of the studies that we have done, and some of these studies are still going on. We cross these mice and we get wild type pups that are fed osteopontin free milk, like I said, or milk with osteopontin. First, we looked at milk yield. It's important that uh, we don't hurt the mother's capacity to make milk. And we also looked at actually where the osteopontin uh, is directed in the body by looking at organ distribution. Then we looked at the morphology of the intestine. We looked at cytokines as a measure of immune function. And we even challenged them with LPS, which is a bacterial agent that can be used to, to mimic an infection. And then we assessed the cytokines. We took out the brains. But before that, we actually did a battery of cognitive tests to see if brain function had been affected by the presence or absence of osteopontin. So 
what we found in here and as I will show to you, is that milk osteopontin may promote brain development via upregulation of osteopontin expression in vivo. And what I mean with this, I will explain it in a few slides. First, osteopontin is abundantly expressed in the brain. So that kind of signals that it may be biologically important in the brain. And in rat brains, Osteopontin expressing cells as, appear as early as embryonic day. Sorry, embryonic day one, and increase remarkably during the first week of postnatal life. Osteopontin has been shown to stimulate proliferation of neural progenitor cells isolated from adult rat brain. And OPN is known to be a regular or myelination, an important process in the brain. So there's data indirectly supporting that osteopontin could be that osteopontin could be important in brain development in early life also. First, like I said, it's important to check and we looked at production of milk and it was identical in the knockout dams as in the white type ones. So no effect on that. And we actually also looked at uh, the presence of osteopontin in the stomach, S, and in the upper part of the small intestine, middle part of the small intestine, and lower part of the small intestine. And we used what is called Western blotting, that is we used an antibody towards bovine osteopontin. And as you can see here, Sorry, mouse osteopontin. And here you can see that we have osteopontin in several bands. You always get several bands for, bovine, for uh, osteopontin, both in human, bovine, and mouse milk. <clears throat> and then you can see that it survives digestion. It goes down in the stomach. It survives quite a bit in the small intestine. You get some larger fragments, but largely you can see we can see active bovine uh, mouse osteopontin in the small intestine after they have been fed by their mothers. Body weights were normal, meaning that milk uh, quality was not impaired. Uh, brain weights were normal, so nothing really striking when it comes to brain growth at all. We didn't see any difference in histology in the pups that had been fed uh, milk with or without osteopontin. We saw a trend when it comes to gene expression uh, of uh, osteopontin in the brain. This was not significant, but you can see that by day eight, some 50% more of uh, osteopontin uh, was expressed as messenger RNA. But more importantly, here we're looking at osteopontin protein. So here we use Western blotting antibodies towards osteopontin, mouse osteopontin in the brain. And we saw a trend by day four, this is osteopontin uh, um, free milk, and this is osteopontin pups that were fed milk with osteopontin. And there was a slight trend by day four, but in particular at day six and day eight, you can see much higher levels of osteopontin in the brain of pups that have been fed milk with osteopontin. Later on, by day 10, 12, those differences uh, went away. But during a very important time period of brain development, that is between day 6 and 10, there were highly significant uh, quantities of endogenously made osteopontin in pups that were fed milk with osteopontin. Remember the clinical study that we did? we found significantly higher levels of endogenous osteopontin in the circulation. So this is going hand in hand with the observation. Higher expression of osteopontin in the body 
when you are fed milk with osteopontin. And that osteopontin can, as we saw in the human study, be bovine osteopontin. Like I said, we did also tests for cognitive performance of these uh, mouse pups. The first uh, test that we used is called the passive avoidance test. And here you can see the, the pups have a tendency to hide in the dark compartment and then uh, we have a white uh, compartment with light. We put them in here during the training period and then they get the foot shock. So a small electrical shock, nothing serious, but they avoid it and go into the dark compartment. So they're trained in this on day two, and on day three, we test them. And then, if you then have a good cognitive ability, you avoid going out there because you remember, here is where I got an electric shock. And here you can see that the uh, pups with, that have been fed milk with osteopontin had a significantly higher latency. That is, they were very hesitant to go out and get a shock, while those that did not receive osteopontin had a much higher tendency to do that. So highly significant difference in this uh, capacity to learn or um, improve memory. We also did the rotor rod test, which is a way, uh, another way to assess it. And I won't go over the details, but they go on this rotating wheel, and the more they have learned uh, and remember how to behave on the wheel, the better they will do. And here, again, highly significant difference uh, in the day 30 pups if they had been fed milk with osteopontin than without. Myelination, like I said, is a very important process in the brain. Uh, it involves the forming of myelin sheaths that allow nerve impulses to move. Uh, it's a complex process involving many steps. And osteopontin is secreted by astrocytes and may stimulate proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursors to promote myelination. So we looked at this. And here you can see proteins related to myelination on the right side. We have the red one here on the outer side. We have the yellow one here on the inner side. And these two proteins, which are called uh, myelin-associated glycoprotein and myelin uh, oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. Here you can see, together with the other uh, important uh, proteins in brain development, at each day, we looked at gene expression, day two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, etc. And you can see that the osteopontin free uh, pups, or fed the milk, which did not contain osteopontin, mm -hmm. they had significantly lower expression of these important genes, uh, particularly at day six and eight. So, therefore, you can clearly say that uh, gene expression of genes involved in uh, brain development and brain function are impaired if they are not getting osteopontin in their milk. So to summarize, milk osteopontin increases osteopontin expression in the brain in early life, and the upregulated osteopontin expression may increase myelination and promote brain development. We also looked at immune development in the mouse model. We had looked at that in the human model before, but now we go going down to basics. And like I said before, osteopontin is involved in cytokine expression and may exert both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory actions. So, like I mentioned early on, we challenged these pups with a lipopolysaccharide which is a major component of uh, gram-negative bacteria. And it's used, like I said, to mimic infection. Uh, in this case, the LPS used is from E. coli 0111B4, 
which causes diarrhea in, in infants. And here you can see, this is interferon gamma, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. And at four hours, there was a significant difference between those pups that had been fed milk with osteopontin as compared to those that were fed milk without osteopontin. By eight hours, there, there were even more pronounced differences between them. You can see there's a little bit difference. We looked at it at day 20, day 30, and day 40. And there's a little bit difference in the timing at the different ages. But over, overall, the anti-inflammatory cytokines were stimulated by the presence of osteopontin. Going back to TNF-alpha, as you saw in the human study. And here you can see that uh, pups that were fed milk with osteopontin at significantly lower TNF alpha, both at one hour and at two hours. Highly significant and going hand in hand on what we saw in the human clinical study in Shanghai. So, to summarize, milk osteopontin may contribute to resistance to LPS administration or bacterial infection by altering immune responses. So, to conclude, from the clinical study and from the preclinical studies in animals, uh, I would say that milk osteopontin plays important roles in brain, immunological and gut development during early life. Breast milk osteopontin likely provides beneficial bioactivities to the breastfed infant. And the addition of bovine osteopontin to infant formula may provide some of these bioactivities. And the mouse studies may give us guidance for what we should look at in the next or upcoming clinical trials on formula with osteopontin. I would like to acknowledge my postdoc, Roland Jang, and my visiting postdoc, Christine Krell, that contributed to uh, all the, the research that you have seen uh, in the animal models. And with that, I would like to thank for your attention and uh, stop by there. Thank you.